this story about thanks for the organizers for inviting me, but <laughs> it just happens that I am one of the organizers. So, um, so um, yeah, so yesterday, actually, that weekend, I've been here for the entire duration of the whole workshop. Um, I've been the one who actually sends the emails every morning, if you receive the emails. Um, some of you may not know, but they are in the spam folder. Anyway, so, um, um, yeah, so yesterday I was flying out of uh, Indiana where I attended my daughter's commencement, and then when I opened the, um, the computer at the end of the flight, I realized that I was speaking, so I started presenting this talk. So, um, yeah, so I, um, so those are uh, some of the collaborators that I have on these are here, and I will talk about the role of ligands. Um, I will keep, like, for those of you that don't know me, I've been working on this for quite some time. I started with DNA when I met Oleg in a DOE uh, conference and he explained this work and then I started becoming familiar with the whole literature on DNA. Then I moved to um, other systems and I worked on um, hydrocarbons and then I also been doing other things on the composite tectons that um, Rob will speak later and more recently the chiral lattices that Kian Chen maybe will talk at some point, but today what I want to talk is about um, binary super lattices, super lattices in general that are obtained by solvent evaporation. And um, this is a process that um, you probably by now all know, which basically you put uh, these systems into some organic solvent, you evaporate the solvent, and uh, what is left typically um, is um, uh, in this case uh, super binary super lattices, you have two components. Um, we've had a lot, lots of discussions about uh, general uh, solvent evaporation during the workshop. Um, but um, the question that I would like to bring up is um, how you actually describe uh, these type of systems. And um, the standard model that people started from the very beginning uh, was with hard spheres, and hard spheres are basically um, billiard balls, that's what we think about them, yeah? And there is recently a very nice uh, review by Marguline um, that I recommend you to all read, I mean, it's in the archive, where she basically, where they basically have summarized all the results uh, that uh, there are on harsh spheres. So um, the first model, when people started to get this, uh, this, uh, um, these super lattices, they started to interpret them in terms of hard spheres. So then, obviously, the first question is, um, well, I mean, you know, you look at the nanoparticle, you have the core, and then there are home ligands that you have grafted, and this, in principle, you would assume that they are deformable, so the system is not really incompressible, it's not really a hard sphere. Um, so the first question is, um, okay, so let's see how that works. And basically what it means is that you try to pack these systems as hard spheres, and you know we all know what uh, packing fraction means. It means how much actual space is occupied with respect to the total space that is available. And for example, for a simple case like this, for a geometric, um, you will have a total area which is 2R, and then the actual occupied will be just uh, the circle, and then you will get a packing fraction which is uh, this much, which you know, it's uh, this number. And if you go to three dimensions, well, there are these uh, Bravais lattices. I mean, the FCC will give 74%, the BCC 68%, and the simple cubic is basically half of the space is completely empty. Um, when you look at a uh, system with have two components, then you can imagine that you can go and fill the interstitials with the smaller component, and you would get something like this, and obviously in that case, the packing fraction increases with respect to what you would have for the single component, but in reality what happens is that it is a little more complicated because it depends on the ratio uh, between the two radii. So if the, these uh, red spheres, you start to make them a little bit bigger, then you will have to displace the blue uh, 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 circles, and then that will change the packing fraction, and in fact the packing fraction will start going down. So this is what typically happens. In other words, the packing fraction depends uh, on the ratio between the, of the radius or the diameter of the large to the small spheres. And when you go to three dimensions, um, then uh, for each lattice, um, depending on what is the ratio of the two spheres, you will get plots that look like that. This is a whole listing of lattices, and you see that you typically have 
um, let me see here. What is the, the okay? So you will have that. Um, um, you will have that there are some maximum where the packing fraction is maximum, and then for other values, the packing fraction will be very low. So, um, with that in mind, the first question is okay, so if I'm going to uh, model these systems as hard spheres, the first thing is I need to know uh, what is the radius of the hard sphere. And this is an important question because um, it's the basis to start any theoretical treatment uh, in terms of predicting something about these systems. So um, traditionally, the experimental is the way they've done it is they just put a nanoparticle on two dimensions and then they look at, they form a, a single component lattice and then the, the lattice constant of this triangular lattice will give you uh, basically the diameter of or the hard sphere diameter for this nanoparticle. This is okay, but it's not the best possible definition you can give. Uh, because what happens is that um, in these systems, um, the, there is an interaction between the nanoparticle and the substrate. And the other thing that happens is that the ligands that are on the opposite side of the substrate, they do not have any constraint, so they can be um, all pointing up, and that will give room to the other ligands to change. It's not a bad definition, but it is not the best possible definition. The best possible definition is actually the one that was given by Uzi Landman um, in this paper and other papers, which is called the OPM model, and basically what it uses is um, you, you have that, um, this is the, the total stretch ligand length, and so that basically you have this dimensionless hydrocarbon stand, and then you also have the dimensionless grafting density, which is the ratio of the actual grafting density to the, most, the, the maximum possible grafting density that you could put on this, uh, let's assume for the moment, spherical nanoparticle. Then I will change what happens if the, the shape is not quite spherical, because most of the nanoparticles uh, actually all the nanoparticles, they are never truly spherical. They are always polyhedral. So the sphere is always an approximation. Um, so then when you do that, um, basically you assume that in that cone, uh, the chain behaves as a non-solvent, and that gives you that prediction, and that prediction is the best possible, to, in, in our opinion, a definition that you can give of your hard sphere. Um, and um, the, so then you have this prediction, and then that, also tells you that now you can tell uh, what will be the lattice constant that you can predict assuming hard spheres when you put uh, different types of spheres together. Um, another thing that we'll say is that this result is exactly the same that you would get if instead of experimentally defining the diameter as an hexagonal lattice, you define the diameter uh, from an FCC lattice. Okay, and that would be the best possible definition according. So now with this definition, um, we can go and see how well we can do, how well this does in terms of predicting actual uh, numbers in um, real systems. And for that purpose, um, there is a, a, a paper by um, Dimitri, um, which was, uh, in, for me at least, it was a very, very good paper because he provided a huge amount of data that usually was not available in the previous literature. So they went there and they measured very accurately uh, lattice constant, uh, densities, um, even ligand conformations for many different situations. And there was a whole wealth of data that uh, as a theorist uh, was fantastic because then you can make actual quantitative predictions, not just saying, okay, this lattice or that other lattice. You can just say, okay, this lattice with this lattice constant. Um, but before we go there, let's look at what is the state of the art. I mean, this is from that paper. And what you see here is that there is a correlation between the packing fraction and the points where the experiments are, but this correlation is not perfect, yeah? What we see here, for example, the, there is this point, and if you believe the hard sphere, this is telling you that this lattice exists at a 50% packing fraction. Usually, given that these systems are driven by Van der Waals forces, um, that would really be hard to believe, because this whole lattice should be unstable. There is way too much free space there for this lattice to survive in this situation. So um, even though this has predictive power, because if I, if, I, if I say magnesium zinc 2, I can tell that the ratios of nanoparticles where I will find it is not here, it's somewhere around here, so there is predictive power here, but it is not like super 
predictive power. It's kind of very, very qualitative. And also, and this is actually an open question still, well, I mean, uh, if I know that it is magnesium zinc 2, I know that I have to look for this, but I cannot tell whether it will be magnesium zinc 2 as it is here or something else. We will get to that. So anyway, the bottom line here is that we have an imperfect correlation between packing fraction and experiment. And not only that, I mean, this is actually taken from the paper by Dimitri. What you see here is that the black spots are the experimental data and the white ones are the hard sphere prediction. So you see here that there is a clear discrepancy, even though, you know, the, the hard sphere is very valuable, and I'll get back to that. So anyway, so this is where we are. And the first thing that I thought um, when I looked at this problem is that let's try to do what happens if we do soft spheres. Let's just soften a little bit the spheres and let's do something which is like, no, not really hard spheres, but softer potential. And when you do that, um, well, basically you have a potential that looks like this. Um, and basically, um, let me tell you the bottom line is that um, you don't get much. You know, basically what you learn is that you get extra parameters that you can use to adjust, but it has really very little predictive power. Um, so for this, for if I have to take a conclusion here is that you don't need to go to soft sphere. Just stay with the hard spheres because at the end of the day, they are more predictive than the, than the model. So here, for example, I have a situation where this is a typical super lattice binary lithium-3 bismuth, and this is the prediction of the hard spheres, and this is where the experiments are. Actually, this experiment was done after uh, what I'm going to describe now. So, okay, so at this point, um, clearly, um, softer potential is not going to be much helpful, and there is a lot of work that we did here, but I'm not going to go into details. Um, and what we did is we thought about other things. So what are the other things? Well, the other things is that, in general, um, clearly the hard sphere description has to break down in some way. And the way we consider is the following. So the idea is that um, there are situations like this one where basically all ligands are pointing radially from the center of the sphere. But then there is a situation where you could have one of the, the ligands play out of a center, and we call this configuration uh, a vortex. It's not a very good name, but I don't know, yeah? Uh, we can discuss. And then you can have many situations where you have different vortices that are uh, distributed along the sphere. For those of you that like topology, there is no topological restriction here about how many vortices you can have because this is a three-dimensional order parameter. It's not a two-dimensional order parameter on the sphere. Um, so anyway, the bottom line is that um, the idea was that um, vortices, display configurations, create domain walls, they interact very strongly, and there is a maximum of these numbers that you can have on a sphere, energetically, not topologically, just pure energy. And the other thing is that um, once you have one of these play configurations, then um, you can uh, also maximize the packing fraction because then you can break the hard sphere description, but there is also a maximum of the packing fraction that you can attain. So when you play together with these things, um, these, they behave like hybrid orbitals. The idea is that you go to a situation where in some cases you can have these gigantic deformations of the ligands driven by these display configurations. So um, that you can make it into a precise way where you can calculate uh, all of the quantities. And for example, this is magnesium zinc 2, so this is how it works. You just put magnesium zinc 2 and then you, you draw the hard sphere model and you put is a hard sphere. If you do that, you will see that this is actually a diamond lattice where this, the, the red ones are in touch with each other, and the blue one is actually a pyrochloric lattice which have coordination six, that, that they are also uh, in touch with each other, but they do not really touch uh, the blue and the red. So then, according to the rules that we have uh, postulated, the reds can be deformed because they form coordination four, but the blues cannot because they have coordination six. So therefore, what you get is that this magnesium zinc two, which is the yellow line here, now when you take that into account, the right part of the curve will correspond to the blue ones, but the left part is the red ones, 
And therefore, those are the ones that can be deformed. And now the low packing fraction has become high packing fraction because you have this ability to splay the ligands. And that's what is re reflected there. And now you can have a very precise prediction about the lattice constant R. And this is actually what I showed you. And this was our prediction. Not only that, when we got, when I did that prediction, I couldn't fit that point there, the gold copper. Then I sent an email to Dimitri and Michael Balls, and I said, look, there is something going on here. And they said, well, we know. What happens is that when we watch many times these things, the ligands come off. So this is a totally different physics than the one that you were describing. And they even have a paper where they discuss that case that came out later. And now going back to here, this is what the new packing fracture looks like when you take into account uh, the ligands. So, so this is actually where we are. Those are basically spherical. Um, but then we started moving into more uh, complex geometries. And here um, I started collaborating with uh, um, Maxim Kovalenko at Zurich, which unfortunately couldn't get the visa to come here. He was, uh, you know, he applied in January and he still hasn't gotten it. Um, and we started looking at systems that correspond to um, cubes and spheres. And basically this is what you have, and this is an, an excellent model in which you can generalize now the result that we've developed for spheres, now to start considering mixed systems where you have cube, cubes and also spheres. Um, and let me tell you that the phase diagram of this system is actually pretty complex. And this is what it looks like, and this is only considering two types of nanocubes, 8.6 and 5.3. So you can imagine that when you start considering the experiment, this is experimental, by the way. Um, when you mix cubes of all sizes and all these other nanoparticles, the, the phase diagram here can be um, overwhelming. It already is, but I'm just saying, it will be uh, a lot more, yeah? So now the next question is, okay, so we have the hard sphere diameter for the spheres. Um, we, we know in which situations they have these large deformations. We know how to compute precisely where these uh, lattice constants are and how they are distributed and what is the distribution of the ligands. So what happens now with the cubes? So we have to go back and repeat the same uh, arguments now for cubes. And basically what you get is that this is the what we claim is the equivalent hard sphere diameter for the cubes. So it's very similar to the sphere, except that there are some geometric corrections. Um, and then the other thing that happens here is that when cubes interact face to face, they behave as hard cubes. But then if they interact through corners or through edges, and in our paper here, this paper that appeared like two weeks ago, um, you can also see that um, they form these plate configurations, and therefore the whole uh, hard sphere description breaks down. And then, then the, the question becomes that um, obviously uh, you would assume that if the ligand becomes sufficiently long, uh, the cube at the end can be modeled as a sphere because the shape won't matter, and that's exactly what it is reflected here. So the question is whether the size of the cube is, is long compared to the actual extended length of the ligand. Depending on these two ratios, you will go from the situation where you can have the cube defined as a harsh cube, or you will go to a situation where the sphere becomes uh, the dominant shape. So um, this is actually, and there are obviously intermediate uh, situations where these lengths become comparable, the size and the extended length of the ligand, and in that case, um, there will be uh, a lot more theory that at this moment we have not developed. But, you know, I mean, we've been discussing all these things here and hopefully um, we will be able to answer because, as I mentioned, um, in general, um, the cubes are a pretty realistic uh, situation in the sense that um, that's what you have. But when you go to spheres, there are no truly spherical nanoparticles. They are all polyhedral. And actually we've seen in the talk by Mario that this, the shape actually plays, may play an important role, for example, in terms of the intermediate structures that you can have as you do solving evaporation. Anyway, so going back to the packing, so this is actually one of the structures that um, the experiment found. 
And this is called ABO3. Actually, in this case, it's a binary system. But we, are, we also have results where show that this is actually um, a, a, a system with three components because you can have uh, cubes of different size. Um, and this is sodium chloride. So this is actually um, one case. And, uh, th so these are different, two different super lattices. And then here I want to mention that uh, this is actually what the packing fraction looks when you include these split configurations. Um, and then um, here, what you have is what they look like when you have only strictly hard shapes. And what you see is that the experiments agree very well uh, to the maximum according to the split configurations. Not only that, uh, if you don't include that, then this is where the point would be that would be again at a 50% packing fraction. In other words, all these split configurations are playing a fundamental role in predicting what is the structure of the lattice, and we can do that without adding, uh, without any fitting parameters. So, oh wow, okay. So let me just say that this is a summary of theory. Uh, basically, uh, the idea that you have these large deformations and you have uh, this uh, type of structure. There is another part of theory that I haven't talked that much. Uh, actually, I haven't talked at all, but I would like to mention, which is the role of icosahedral order uh, and what we call quasi frank Casper phases. Uh, but anyway, I would like to spend my remaining five minutes, I think I have five minutes, um, talking about simulations because all of this is theory, but we also do simulations. Um, so this is actually the potential of mean force between two nanoparticles. Um, so here what you have, the blue line, is the free energy, the potential. And one thing to notice is that uh, when I plot the hard sphere uh, diameter, this is the hard sphere diameter. In other words, uh, and the minimum of the potential of mean force, which is the distance in equilibrium, is there. So what you see here is that clearly in this simulation, the, um, the um, hard sphere description breaks down. Uh, is something that we expect because this is a system with coordination one. You have two nanoparticles, you approach them, you calculate the potential, and according to what we already anticipated, we should expect a huge, this, a huge split configuration, which is what we have here. You can see it, here you have. So you can see that at the minimum, uh, you have these ligands that are being pushed away, and that's what you find here. So um, the other thing that I want to emphasize, and this is actually something that because of uh, how prevailing the description of hard spheres are, uh, is that this system is not enthalpically driven. Um, there is a huge uh, energy, uh, which is of the order of many hundreds kVT. There is a huge entropy. The entropy doesn't come from the configurational entropy of the particle. It comes from the, co the entropy of the chains themselves. And those are the two main ingredients that determine the lattice constant. Um, and then in this case, the equilibrium is actually, um, uh, there is a formula for that, and it's basically equal to uh, what it is basically uh, a system where you have the incompressibility constraint. In other words, you pack all the chains so that there is no free space. And that brings up this uh, packing fraction to the one third, packing fraction is less than one, so this, uh, in this particular case, um, they are as close as possible to each other. But in reality, in, in general, um, the distance will be between this OCM, which was a model that was uh, um, anticipated by Shaposnikov and Bluch um, uh, before. And the real lattice is always in between this number and the other number, which is the hard sphere. So uh, what we did is we also calculated uh, free energies for systems that involve not just two nanoparticles, but many nanoparticles. For example, this would be an equal six. Uh, and this is what we basically do. We just compress this system and compute the free energies. And then uh, for n equal 2, this is what you get. So basically in this case, you can also compute assuming that these particles interact with the potential of mean force. They are only two both interactions. So what you can see is that uh, the, um, the blue line, which is the, the, the n equal 2, basically over, uh, overlaps with the potential uh, or sum of potentials, but when you go to larger numbers, for example here, what you see is that this is the free energy, and this is what you would predict if you use only two body potentials, so the difference between these two things give you the presence of many body effects, and they are repulsive. 
So this is actually a situation where by subtracting the actual free energy from the potential that you get um, uh, and having all the potentials, you can compute explicitly the many body effects. And these many body effects are not negligible. They are important. And that tells us that um, any model that you will use that use just a pure two-body potential is likely not going to be successful in predicting what is the equilibrium structure of the system. So this is actually another comparison between, this is from the paper of uh, Dimitri, and this is simulations that we did actually here. Uh, in retrospect, we could have adjusted a little bit the simulations because we didn't use the perfect parameters, but you can see here that you get basically the, uh, the same results and they are all agreeing with theory, that you have the presence of the vortices as we predicted and everything is in agreement. Let me mention that we've done this, the same thing for binary super lattices. So basically we've put the system uh, in a binary, in a, in a simulation box, we put it in a, in a binary super lattice, we compute the free energy and we compare that free energy to the free energy of single component systems in order to establish which one is the equilibrium phase, whether it is the binary or it is the phase separated single component. And the other thing that we can do is we can see what the minimum of the free energy is. So this is actually this curve here. And then you can also tell that um, the red line is the prediction from our OTM, the, the, the one that has these large vortices, and the gray one is the hard sphere. You can see that clearly, again, the hard sphere uh, prediction breaks down. Um, and uh, this is what you have. In fact, uh, you can take a look at the equilibrium, at, uh, at the, the configuration at the equilibrium, and this sign is actually these plate configurations, the vortices that I mentioned, and you can even do the following. You just take this configuration, you draw here the hard sphere diameter, and then you see that they clearly overlap. Clearly, in this case, the hard sphere diameter, uh, you know, is not consistent. Uh, on the other hand, the green one is actually this split configuration that we can also predict, and you can see that they fit extremely well. And you can do the same exercise for FCC. Um, this is for magnesium zinc too but you can do the same for FCC. And when you do the same for FCC, what you see is that the hard sphere matches because at the end of the day, the way we define the hard sphere is basically packing the FCC. It's defined by the FCC um, um, lattice constant. So I think I'm good, no? So um, let me tell you one thing. So this is actually uh, the bottom line here. I didn't talk about the icosahedral order but the, the idea is that we have a tool that can tell us, given a lattice, what is the structure of the lattice, what is the lattice constant, how the, uh, how the ligands are uh, configured, and we can do. We cannot predict which lattice are you going to see. So if Dimitri comes and tells me I have this nanoparticle, I have this other nanoparticle, tell me which lattice I'm going to see, unfortunately, I cannot do that. But if he comes to me and says, I found magnesium zinc 2, I can immediately give him a prediction what is the lattice constant, how the ligands are, where the particles are positioned. So that's where um, I am. So there's here some open question. I would like to finish by showing this paper. Um, this is something we've been written by all the people that we've been here from the very beginning. Uh, so this is a paper that um, uh, there are like 35 pages plus lots of references. And basically, um, this is to highlight open problems, um, not really what we, so all the discussions that we've had, all the ideas, all the different, is kind of reflected here. And, you know, if any of us here have problems, if the uh, experimentalists want to tell theorists what they should work on or what they should not work on, um, please go ahead. Uh, also, the theory will tell experimentalists uh, many things. In my case, the request, is that um, sometimes take a little bit of effort and do what Dimitri did, publish all these huge number of numbers, because that was extremely helpful. And I will end here. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. All right. Yeah, that was a great talk. Um, so when you talk about the cubes, um, that reminded me a lot of work 
involving more exotic ligands, the DNA modified structures. And, and you know, over a decade ago, we, 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 we put out the concept of what we called the zone of anisotropy, uh, which was basically that if you take a long enough ligand and put it on a, a particle, a cube shaped particle, you'll move from cube to basically uh, packing like spheres. What is different about this than that? Because well, uh, th those are more exotic polymers, they're, they're tailorable lengths, and that allows you to kind of systematically build and look at the gradual shift from cube to sphere. And it has big consequences because when you pair it up with the pairing principles of DNA, you can use it to then generate structures that are in between those uh, in, in a deliberate way. Is there something that I'm missing that, that, that is, is different in this context? I think there are two things. Um, number one, these systems are dry. There is no solvent. Uh, and the other thing is that those are short ligands. Um, they are very short ligands. Um, so um, uh, the, sh the size of the ligand compared to the size of the cube is actually small, yeah? So those are the two main differences. The size of which ligands? The, the ligands that are grafted onto the cube. Of these here or the... the here. Deep? Oh, yeah. Okay, because it's basically a ratio. And in, in those papers, we talk about the, the ratio required to get cube-like behavior versus sphere-like behavior. It just seemed very reminiscent of what you were talking well, about. So you're saying the length scale and is, is different. I don't get how the dryness matters. The dry, well, the dryness matters because uh, all these predictions that I have, they ha you have to have a very dry system. Otherwise, the system is swollen, there is lots of solvent, and, and the ligands are much more extended yeah, than they are here. Um, I, I don't know exactly what, what is the system that you, but uh, I would love to, I mean, I, I follow, I, I know very well your work, yeah? Um, so, um, and I, right now, I'm not getting to which paper are you referring to. Okay, so, no, we, we can talk at lunch. Yeah. Oh, right here, uh, David Limmer, UC Berkeley. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the very clear talk. Uh, I very much am sympathetic to the idea of trying to determine an effective hard sphere size and then correct the, the energetics away from that. And so along those lines, I'm wondering if you have compared the hard sphere diameters you've arrived at through geometric arguments to those that were used long ago in liquid state theory from like the WCA theory of liquids, basically where after you subtract out the slowly varying attraction, you look for where you know, the Boltzmann factor from a reference hard sphere fluid best capitulates the Boltzmann factor from the full system. You know, that's a unique definition that then is motivated from statistical mechanics instead of geometry. Well, um, um, so um, the answer is I haven't thought about these lines. Um, the motivation for, um, so, so the answer is I haven't thought, because I mean, what have you basically, uh, I mean, we have simulations here, yeah? And so, so we've done simulations, but the thing is, um, two things. First, all our simulations are for dry systems, again. So there is no diffusion of nanoparticles or anything. We just compute the final equilibrium state and, you know, we assume, okay, let's assume we are in equilibrium, so it doesn't matter how you get there, yeah? So that's the bottom line. Um, the other thing is, um, I mean, there is a lot of ligands here at, at, at the equilibrium, yeah? Um, basically, the way I understand what you are saying is you are trying to take a system which has certain potential and find the optimal parameter that will allow you to describe it as a hard sphere, yeah? Um, this is kind of a dilute system in a way because you still do not get to the type of packing fraction you get here, which uh, are no, no, no. the WCA worked very well describing dense fluids. Okay. Well, um, you know, um, I don't know. We can talk more about sure, it. Sure. Yeah, I mean, you. you know, people sometimes bring up questions that you never thought, and then you try to just uh, you, but it's always, yeah, it's very very old school. Yeah. Stuff. Uh -huh. Yeah, Uri Balin from uh, Hebrew University. Alex, thank you very much. I want to ask about the ligand configurations. Uh, in solution, uh, with relation to ligand length, there is, there is evidence that above about uh, 10 or so carbons in the alkyl chain, ligands start to fold over as well. Have you considered that? Is that happening or we, can I haven't that talked be here. Yeah, so basically we're saying what happens as you make the ligand longer and yeah, longer. Yeah, exactly. 
We, we have uh, a few paper, we have two papers where um, I, I have them here, where we basically looked at uh, the systems that uh, he's been working. Uh, and basically, um, those are polyesterine and those are very long ligands and we have simulations. And one, what we concluded um, is that um, in this system that Qin Chen is working, uh, we, we, we can apply these formulas with some modifications, but they still work to a very large degree. So um, there are many things that happen when you make the ligands long. The most dramatic thing that happens is that when you have a potential of mean force, let me tell you because this is actually, um, it's one of the obvious things that if you do simulation, when you see it, it's, it's obvious. And maybe for some of you it's obvious, but it wasn't obvious for me until we saw the simulation, which is that if you have a ligand like this, yeah, and this is very long, then the polymer will go around the nanoparticle and will form things like this. Yeah, because the ligand is sufficiently long to just go and engulf the entire nanoparticle. So those are new effects that take place when you have two nanoparticles. But then when you have them in the lattice, that cannot happen because, you know, I mean, the entropy of these things are very low. Um, so, you know, there are all sorts of new effects that take place. But the good news is that it's not as accurate, but the, the formulas that I showed still work, yeah? Okay. But again, I want to emphasize the formulas are for dry systems. When the system is swollen, then the polymer has, uh, occupies a much more pervaded volume. And in that case, these formulas are not going to work, yeah? So w once you are done with the drying, then is when the things work, yeah? Uh, so, so I essentially want just to clarify. Uh, so you can determine the uh, spacing by using the space filling argument, right? So, but uh, then you cannot say uh, uh, which structure will win. Um, you mentioned this idea of a repulsive um, vortexes, right? So, uh, did, is any uh, effective interaction between those vertices uh, capable of, of uh, capturing known phase diagrams, so it's not I mean, working. the way I think about it is that the formulas we have provide some zoom rules, and it allows us to predict lattice constants and things like that, but it, it doesn't, it doesn't, it, it is not a free energy, yeah? The only way to compute free energy is by putting the whole atoms and the whole atom simulation and doing the simulation and then computing the free energy, which... Oh, I, I, I then I miss, miss... I mean, uh, the, the, uh, the whole, this whole about the OPM, OTM, all these things, models, they only predict what is constant, they predict what is the configuration, they predict all these things. I would love to have a free energy, and in fact, um, you know, I mean, we have several ideas how to go. I think that... Um, let me expand a little bit. Mm -hmm. I think that at this moment, probably one of the, I mean, there are different ideas that we have. I mean, I think that the models that, um, that Mario has been presenting, I think that they are very, very promising. And probably that's one way that I think this problem can be addressed. Uh, uh, I was rather thinking of some phenomenological approaches based on what you've shown. So uh, if you well, take some, well, you, you started with minimalistic uh, hard sphere argument, yeah. right? You can imagine that if you add uh, some interaction between sort of bond bond interaction angle dependent, you could uh, that that gives you some leverage to capture. Uh, by now, you already know a lot about the structures which are realized, right? So probably uh, uh, that's enough information to to construct some well, sort of technology. Well, but in a way, the example I would put you is that let's say, for example, I mean that. Um, you know, in principle, yes, what you're saying is true, but when you sit down and you try to get the actual thing, um, you start, you have to make a lot of assumptions to introduce new parameters, and well, you know, I mean, at some point, you start losing predictability because you keep adding more parameters, you know, and one thing that I try to do is to just uh, be able to have predictable things, yeah? And if I have to put uh, parameters and uh, make assumptions about the parameters and on top of that these parameters do not have a very clear interpretation, then the experimentalists won't believe me. So, and they shouldn't actually, so. 
Fernando Escobedo from Cornell University. Thank you, Alex, for a very interesting talk. So I was very interested about this, um, this place you know, that, that you uh, described. And uh, so apparently there is like this magic number of six. So when the coordination number is more or less than six, you have this very different behavior. Can you elaborate a little bit yeah. on where that comes from? There is nothing special about six. Actually, if you put eight, I mean, what happens is that the, the effect is very drastic when you have three, four, then five, six is already there. Eight, you still have a little bit of an effect, but it's so small that you can ignore it to first approximation. There is nothing magic about six. It's just that when the coordination is really low, the effect is very drastic. But it's not like all of a sudden at six, there is a sharp transition or anything. It's everything kind of a continuous, but the thing is when you go to six, seven, eight, um, the, the changes are very, very small, and for any practical purpose, you can assume. But if you are really precise, you can still see them, yeah? Mm -hmm. So there is nothing magic about six. It's just that the effect becomes more drastic the lower the coordination. And then six kind of is a reasonable cutoff, but, I mean, there is no reason why you should. You could, like, add these little corrections, but, you know, I mean, uh, our goal with this is to predict what is constant within two, three angstroms. I mean, usually less than three angstrom. And below that, even if I, it doesn't really matter, yeah? If you want more, you have to do a simulation and do it very well, yeah? Thank you. Okay. Sharon. Sharon Glotzer, University of Michigan. Alex, please forgive me for coming in at the end of your talk. <laughs> There's a lot of traffic up from the valley today. Um, I have a question. So if, if someone, if, in this room were to inversely, you know, start with a target uh, crystal structure that you want to get and inversely design what the effective pair potential needs to be between spherical, say, particles or cubic particles. Can you then take that information and inversely design or, or, or tell us what the ligands should be Well, um, in order to then get it? Well, I mean, uh, let me say, one of the main open questions that we have there is that for these systems, uh, the, the, for DNA, the situation is much better. But for these systems that we have solvent evaporation, as of now, and if someone knows better, just, we don't have a model that uh, Dimitri or whoever does this other experience, Kenko or Uri, uh, comes to me and says, I have this nanoparticle, this nanoparticle, tell me what I'm going to see. As far as I can tell, this problem is open, is an open problem, yeah? Now, um, in what you, the, the thing that I can say, and this is something I can say, is that, okay, let's assume that this structure would be magnesium zinc 2. Then I can give you a prediction what the lattice constant will be. Or if you have cubes and spheres, I can give you a prediction what the lattice constant will be. For a given set of, of ligands? Given For a given set of nanoparticle and ligands. And ligands yeah. Right. I want um, to go backwards. Yeah, the problem is that, um, so, so what, is, what it means backwards here? Because um, if you tell me I want this lattice constant and I want this separation, that I can go, but then I still have the big caveat that I cannot guarantee that the experiment will assemble into that particular super lattice. Sure. Okay. Yeah? And that's the big open problem. And, you know, I mean, there are many things that, like, um, with uh, going from, and let me go there because uh, we talked this with Mario Line and others, that going from all atom to machine learning potentials, um, uh, that really, numerically at least, provides a way in which we can go into these type yes. of things. But this potential will not be a simple body potential, a potential that will depend on the environment, will depend on a lot of things. Yeah. It's not a problem because it comes from the, the all atom model, but it is not like a Leonard Jones or something like that. Yeah, it will be, I think that this is a view where numerically we can go to answer that problem. But unfortunately, and this is actually um, we don't have a coarse grain type free energy like we have for DNA, for example, where we can go and, and have a clear prediction that we can tell and the experience go and they find it. Yeah? We will hear a bit more in these directions. And also, a lot of points that were brought up here were also points that were already discussed during the workshop. And I think one, at least for me, a hope that I get to take away from this workshop is that 
now everybody of us knows more about what are interesting problems and what are sort of the, the points where maybe we don't quite have the answers yet. And then in the future, yes. we have a lot to do. To so up. anyone that has an open question, just go there and write it. And hopefully there will be. And the, the author list is not fixed. So there's still a, p a possibility to, to add yourself as to the author's list. Um, unfortunately, we are at the end of the time. But there is time, of course, during the lunch uh, now to ask Alex and all the other speakers uh, a lot uh, more questions. So the lunch will be for one and a half hours. It's the same place where we had the coffee. So please go there. There will be a buffet. You can, you can take a plate. You can choose any, any table you want. And we will be back here in 90 minutes. Let's thank Alex and all the speakers again. And, uh, <laughs>